The campaigns that led to the fight for the Red October factory began with the German invasion of Soviet Russia in 1941, known as Operation Barbarossa. After initial successes, the German advance was halted at the gates of Moscow. The next year, the German High Command developed a new plan called Case Blue, which had as its goal the seizure of the valuable Russian oil fields in the Caucasus region. Once again, the German campaign began with great advances. However, the Caucasus offensive soon ground to a halt, and by mid-September, Stalingrad had become the new major objective for the attacking German forces in southern Russia. On 13 September 1942, the German 6th Army under General Friedrich Paulus began its assault on the city itself, which was defended by Lieutenant General Vasily Choykov's 62nd Army. Within two weeks, the Germans had cleared much of the south and central portions of the city, although the Soviets stubbornly clung to a few small enclaves. Nonetheless, Paulus considered the center and south fighting to be over and began the fight to take the northern factory district. After a surprisingly rapid and successful assault on the tractor factory on 14 and 15 October, the Germans opened their attack on the Barricade factory on the following day. The attack was more difficult, taking almost a week for the Germans to clear most of the factory. By 23 October, the Germans could now turn their attention to the Red October factory. Stalingrad derived its value from the symbolic importance to both sides because of its name. It wasn't strategically or operationally important except as a crossing point for the Volga River, nor was it easily defended given that it was on the west side of the river. The nature of operations in Stalingrad, and particularly the Red October factory complex, shaped the environment extensively. Its terrain reduced unit frontages and depths to the point that two divisions fought over a one square kilometer area for over a month. The 100th Jaeger Division was the command originally assigned the objective of capturing the Red October factory. By the time Seidlitz's 51st Army Corps was ready to make the attack in the third week of October, however, that division was too worn down to accomplish the task. Anticipating the problem, Paulus had already ordered General Richard von Schwerin's 79th Infantry Division to begin shifting forces from its positions near Kletskaya on the Don River west of Stalingrad to an assembly area behind the 100th Jaeger Division. Schwerin's division was to assume responsibility of the northern half of the 100th Division sector. It also became the designated assault force for the Red October Factory. In terms of land area, the Red October factory was only slightly smaller than the other two major industrial complexes in North Stalingrad. The area was roughly 1,100 meters long by 800 meters wide. The buildings were also generally smaller in the Red October area, but they tended to be more densely packed. Key locations within or near the complex included the Greenbelt, the Bonny Ravine, the Workers' Village, the Strong Point School, the Red October Fuel Depot, the Volga River, the Finger Ravine, the Settlement, the Slag Heaps, and the Ladder Building, which was the factory main administration building. The major industrial buildings or halls within the factory complex were numbered by the Germans as depicted. As later events would reveal, the main Soviet defensive position within the factory was Hall 4, also known by the Soviets as the Martinovsky Shop. Most of the fighting in the Red October factory would center on this building for the next three weeks. By the time the 79th Infantry Division made its initial attack on the Red October factory, the structures and grounds had already experienced a huge amount of destruction from artillery fire and aerial attacks. Almost all the buildings were heavily damaged and rubble was everywhere. The twisted steel of elevated catwalks, piles of stone and rubble, stacks of bricks, shell holes and Soviet fighting positions were strewn throughout the grounds. The area was an ideal location for defenders and a nightmare for those attacking into it. The Soviet defense of the Red October factory illustrates aspects of current United States Army doctrine which discuss the role of defensive tasks. According to FM 3-0, there are three primary defensive tasks, area defense, mobile defense, and retrograde. Major General Stepan S. Guryev's 39th Guards Rifle Division defended the Red October factory using today's concept of the area defense to retain what was considered decisive terrain and to deny that vital area to the enemy. Guryev's defense was also an effort to attrit the German forces as a prelude to a later Soviet counteroffensive in November. 
FM 3-0 states that units in defensive positions accomplish their missions independently or in combination by defeating the enemy with fires, absorbing the strength of the attack within the position, or destroying the enemy with a local or major counterattack. Guryev's command would employ all of these aspects at the Red October factory. The division was composed of three guards rifle regiments plus division troops. At the time of the initial attack on 23 October, the division's artillery was located on the east bank of the Volga. The division strength in the city itself stood at about 3,000 men. Initially, most elements of the division were forward, defending along the main rail line west of the factory. If the Germans were successful in pushing Guryev's forces back from that line, they would fall back to prepared defenses in the halls of the Red October factory. There, the 112th Regiment was responsible for defending the workers' village, where a school had been built into a formidable strong point, as well as halls 8, 8A, 9, and 10. The 39th Division's 120th Guards Rifle Regiment, commanded by Major A.I. Goryachev, was responsible for halls 3 through 7 and hall 12. The regiment's primary defense position was hall 4, the Martinovsky shop, which was typically defended by between 100 and 400 men, depending on recent casualties. The 117th Regiment was responsible for Halls 1 and 2, and the small settlement east of there. It also formed the division's reserve and primary counterattack force. Similar to guidance provided in our own FM 3-0, Soviet commanders in the 39th Guards Rifle Division integrated obstacles, counterattacks, and planned fires into their defense in order to isolate and overwhelm the enemy. In addition to the division's artillery on the other side of the river, the Soviet infantrymen were equipped mainly with the mosin nagant model rifle and the famous PPSH submachine gun, but possessed a liberal number of light and medium machine guns to support their fire plan as well. They also possessed hand grenades and the ever-present Molotov cocktail. Assigned or attached to the units of the 39th Guards Division were a number of heavier weapons integrated into Guryev's area defense. These included a number of 50, 82, and 120mm mortars, 7.62mm, 303 caliber, and 51mm light, medium, and heavy machine guns, and 45 and 57mm anti-tank guns spread throughout the position. On arrival in Stalingrad, the 79th Infantry Division consisted of only two infantry regiments, plus the standard complement of other division troops. The division's 226th Infantry was detailed on a temporary mission elsewhere, so Seidlitz attached the 100th Division's 54th Jaeger Regiment to Schreren's command for the initial assaults on the factory. That regiment, however, had been ground down in the earlier fighting in the city. Before the fight for Hall 4 concluded in mid-November, Several other German units, as well as the 369th Croatian Infantry Regiment and a Pioneer Battalion, would later be attached to the division for operations in the Red October area. At the time of the initial attack, the division possessed about 4,500 assault troops, mostly concentrated in the battalions of the division's two infantry regiments. The 54th Jaeger Regiment possessed, at best, about 1,000 assault troops. The 79th Division's infantrymen were originally equipped largely with the Mauser 98 rifle. As the division came into the line in Stalingrad, a large number of the assault troops were re-equipped with the MP-40 submachine gun based on the experience of city fighting thus far. Generally speaking, the older rifles were used by those troops employed in an overwatch or support role, while the primary assault troops received the submachine guns. The attackers also possessed the excellent MG-42 machine gun, in addition to plentiful potato masher grenades and explosives. Furthermore, for the attack, the assault troops would be supported by Panzerkampfwagen Mark III and Mark IV tanks from the 24th Panzer Division, as well as the Sturmgeschütz III assault guns of the 244th and 245th Assault Gun Battalions. The 51st Army Corps' attack plan was for the 100th Jaeger Division to conduct holding attacks to the south of the 79th Division. To the north, the 14th Panzer Division would attack to seize the Bread Factory and a ravine south of the Barricotti Factory, while the 305th Infantry Division would attack to seize the rest of the Barricotti. The 79th Division's attack plan for 23 October was to be conducted in three phases. The objective for the first phase was to attack and seize the railroad just to the east of the main line of resistance. This was the Soviets' initial defense line. 
There, the 79th Division would halt for a massive Stuka and artillery attack on the factory before moving into the complex. The second objective was the Red October factory itself. Specific halls were assigned to each assault regiment. The final objective for the division was the banks of the Volga River. The division would attack with all three regiments on line. The 212th Infantry Kampf Group would attack on the division's right. It was given the mission to capture halls 8, 9, and 10 within the factory complex. On the left, the now battalion-sized 54th Jaeger Regiment was reinforced with seven tanks from the 24th Panzer Division to bolster its strength. It was assigned the task of seizing the latter building in halls 1 and 2 at the north end of the factory. In the center, the 208th Infantry Kampf Group was the 79th Infantry Division's main effort. Commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Richard Wolfe, the regiment was reinforced with a company from the 244th Assault Gun Battalion, a Pioneer Company, and a Heavy Rocket Launcher Battalion. It was assigned to capture halls 3 through 7 and 12. German and Soviet fires created numerous obstacles to tactical movement in the form of craters and rubble. The German 79th Division also faced significant dilemmas in terms of balancing tactical surprise against effective fire support in relatively small, heavily damaged, and well-fortified physical areas. U.S. Army doctrine says that field artillery fires facilitate an attacking unit's maneuver by destroying, degrading, or neutralizing selected enemy forces and positions. Lacking precision munitions, the German 79th Division relied upon massed fires to destroy, neutralize, and suppress Soviet forces in the area of the Martinovsky shop. However, neither it nor the higher German echelons were ever able to effectively isolate the 39th Guards Rifle Division from its own fire support or effectively interdict the sustainment support concentrated on the east bank of the Volga. For the attack, Wolf reorganized the 208th Infantry into two attack wedges, each based on the regiment's 1st and 2nd Battalions. The 1st Battalion would attack on the left with the 2nd on its right. Each wedge was further divided into two waves. Each wave was further organized into three groups. The assault group was reinforced with engineers and armed largely with MP-40 submachine guns, grenades, and satchel charges. Its mission was to attack through the Soviet defenses and penetrate to unhinge enemy positions. The covering group was equipped with light machine guns, rifles, grenades, and light mortars. Its mission was to provide protective and covering fires for the assault group and screen the flanks. The clearing group was equipped similarly to the covering group. Its mission was to reduce bypass resistance nests and bring up supplies. The organization of the second wave was identical to that of the first. The second wave would pass through the first as needed to continue the attack, at which the first wave would then assume the reserve role. When the 79th Infantry Division arrived in Stalingrad on 19 October, Schwerin was unaware of its new mission. Wolf himself later stated that, We only received our new combat orders when we arrived in Stalingrad. The 79th Infantry Division had been earmarked to take the gigantic Red October metallurgical works from the Soviets, advance down to the Volga and assume defensive positions at the riverbank. When they learned of the mission and the plan to attack the Red October on the following day at a coordination meeting with Seidlitz, Schwerin and all his regimental commanders objected that there was not enough time to conduct an adequate reconnaissance and plan for a successful attack. The Luftwaffe representatives at the meeting insisted that the ground attack go forward due to the pre-planned airstrikes, but Seidlitz relented and rescheduled the attack for 23 October. Gaining and refining combat information about the enemy is critical to developing the intelligence necessary for developing viable courses of action. Collecting information is a continuous activity during the plan, prepare, and execute cycle. The type of attack a commander can conduct is largely a function of the intelligence and time available. Lieutenant Colonel Wolfe's insistence on a delay so that he could conduct a reconnaissance before attacking the Red October factory changed the nature of his operation from a movement to contact to a hasty attack and likely resulted in lower casualties and greater tactical success than his unit would have suffered if it had attacked on the original timeline. Wolf did not waste the time given to him for preparations. He immediately sent out reconnaissance parties to figure out the best attack routes. The major shock to both he and Eichler was the presence of a long train of railroad cars parked to the division's front, barring the way along the rail line. The German front line was too close to the railroad for aerial attacks against the massive obstacle. 
Moreover, the 6th Army would not allow a rearward movement so that the Luftwaffe could pulverize the cars and make holes through which the 244th's assault guns and other heavy vehicles could move through. Instead, Wolfe developed an alternative plan using his assault guns and artillery in direct fire mode, along with engineer demolition teams, to blast a few holes through the obstacle at key street crossings. Another concern for Wolfe developed when he discussed the attack with Colonel Armin Weber, commander of the 54th Jaeger Regiment on his regiment's left. When I visited the commander of this regiment in order to discuss the situation with him, Weber said to me, You can't expect much anymore from my troops. In these long days, we've been completely exhausted and bled dry. The fighting spirit is gone. Just wait until your troops have fought here for 14 days. You'll be no different. The Jaeger commander's comment about the lack of his men's fighting spirit would begin to bear itself out almost immediately when the attack began. Soviet and German forces each faced significant challenges with movement and maneuver during the fighting in and around the Red October factory. The heavily damaged buildings, cratered landscape, and rubble obstacles hindered movement for both sides, but favored the interior lines inherent in the Soviet positions. The effectiveness of fires in support of German tactical movement was ultimately less effective facilitating maneuver because it added to the rubble and obstacles troops had to overcome while closing with Soviet forces in the Martinovsky shop. German army and Luftwaffe fires were never sufficiently coordinated at appropriate echelons to interdict Russian movement across the Volga, and therefore unable to effectively isolate the 39th Guards Rifle Division. While each side could achieve limited surprise and momentum during their attacks and counterattacks at the lowest tactical levels, the difficult terrain and advantages it provided benefited the defender in terms of retaining areas occupied in the factory complex. As planned, the German assault began at 0700 on 23 October with the usual wave of Stuka dive bombing attacks, followed by an hour-long artillery, mortar, and naval warfare bombardment against the Soviet defenses. The division's Kampf groups, or battle groups, attacked at 0810. The weakened 54th Jaeger Regiment immediately stalled against the positions of the Soviet 895th Rifle Regiment defending at a railroad bridge. On the Jaeger's immediate right, however, Wolf's 208th Kampf Group and Eichler's 212th farther south assaulted the Soviet's first line of defense along the rail line. Wolf's plan to penetrate the long row of rail cards proceeded surprisingly well, and within an hour his infantry had overrun the Soviet positions and the engineers were busy blasting holes through the cars. By 0930, both regiments had successfully crossed the railroad and continued an impressive drive against relatively light opposition. The attack had apparently caught the Soviets by surprise, but they would soon recover. By 1030, elements of both the 208th and 212th Kampf groups had made their way through the communal gardens known as the Green Belt, west of the factory, and had reached the factory's internal rail line. Due to the rapid advance, Schwerin approved Wolf's request to proceed into the factory without the pre-planned airstrikes and artillery preparation. Even so, Wolf had good communications with the Luftwaffe strike commander above. The Kampf Group commander was able to direct the Stukas and his supporting artillery to lay down blocking fires north and east of the factory to prevent Soviet reinforcement. The ground assault proceeded without pause and both regiments quickly gained access to the factory grounds but by then the Soviet resistance began to stiffen. To complicate matters for the German attack, the Soviet defenders were able to bring significant direct fire to bear from the Banyi Ravine to the south into the two 12th Kampf Group's right flank. Colonel Eichler's 2nd Battalion ran into heavy resistance in the workers' village in the same area, particularly from a school which had been turned into a strong point. Soviet forward observers high up on Mami of Kurgan brought in effective indirect fires onto the attacking troops as well. By 10.35, the 2nd Battalion, 208th Infantry, had seized Hall 5A, and the 1st Battalion was attacking Halls 3 and 4. Elements of the 1st Battalion, 212th Infantry, moved into Hall 5A, while others prepared to attack Hall 8. At the same time, the 2nd Battalion attacked the school strong point and the workers' village to the south. The attacks continued throughout the day, and one by one the factory halls fell to the German assault troops. By 1600, the 212th had captured Halls 5, part of 8, and 9, 
and the 208th had captured Halls 3, 5A, 6, and part of 7. An element of Wolfe's 1st Battalion had even penetrated into the northwest end of the Martinovsky shop, Hall 4. About 1615, two assault companies of the 2nd Battalion 208th Infantry were actually able to reach the banks of the Volga east of Hall 7 as fighting centered on Hall 10. Elements of the 212th were also able to reach the same area. Wolfe sent in his regimental reserve company to bolster the troops of the Volga in order to widen the penetration there, but the company was unable to reach the bluffs. After breaching the Soviet first echelon defense along the rail line and discovering that the enemy resistance was light, Lieutenant Colonel Wolfe exercised initiative when he requested to shift the planned air and artillery bombardment so he could continue the attack without pausing to take advantage of actual conditions on the ground. Successful application of the mission command philosophy requires commanders who are prepared to support the initiative of their subordinates. The 79th Division and the Luftwaffe were able to change their scheme of fire and close air support to accommodate Wolf's quick advance into the factory complex. Thus, Wolf's deviation from the plan allowed the attack to maintain its momentum. The two assault companies of the 2nd Battalion 208th Infantry also exercised initiative when they advanced to the Volga River. While most of their task force was focused on Building 10, both units exploited the opportunity on their own initiative to advance to the river. Eventually, the troops at the river had to be pulled back to the vicinity of Hall 7 because they were too few in number to hold the position against the heavy flanking fire they were receiving. By dusk, the 79th Division had driven a significant wedge into the Red October factory. Soon after nightfall, all key factory buildings were in German hands except Halls 1, 2, part of 8, 8A, and most of 4. The fortress-like school was also still under Soviet control, as was much of the workers' village to the south. On the division left, the 54th Jaeger Regiment's failure to take even its first objective, the bridge, ensured the development of a long flank with gaps, which the 79th Infantry Division found difficult to secure due to the losses sustained during the day's fighting. During the day, the 1st Battalion 208th had succeeded in securing a foothold in the western portion of Hall 4. Because of the 54th Jaeger's failure to advance, however, Wolf was forced to withdraw the battalion from the Martinovsky shop that evening in order to help secure the division's left flank between the factory and the Jaegers. Therefore, the next day, the 208th Infantry would have to attack into Hall 4 again. During the day's fighting, the 79th Infantry Division had suffered 83 men killed and 364 wounded for a total of 447 casualties that day. These were troops which could not be easily or quickly replaced. To bolster the division, Seidlitz attached the 369th Croatian Regiment to Schwerin's command that night to help make up some of the losses. Like the 54th Jaegers, however, the 369th was at best only a battalion in actual strength at this point. The fighting on 23 October heavily attrited the 39th Guards Rifle Division as well. That division was in worse shape and had suffered 60% losses, including Goryachev, the commander of the 120th Guards Rifle Regiment. The political importance of Stalingrad and the ideological determination by both the attackers and defenders played a significant factor in their willingness to sustain heavy casualties during this large-scale combat operation. The Germans, lacking room to maneuver, were often forced to conduct frontal assaults at close range, while the Soviets, fighting in a relatively shallow area of operations with their backs to the river, suffered high casualties as well. Choykov, the 62nd Army commander, had no reserves available and noted that his army now faced the threat of enemy forces penetrating through to the Volga in the sector north of the Banyu Ravine. That night, Troikov apprised Stalingrad Front Commander Yeremenko of the situation and asked for all available indirect fire support for his command to help defeat the German follow-on attack that was sure to come the following day. Hall 4, the Martinovsky shop, constituted the main Soviet defense position within the Red October factory. It was generally located about the center of the factory area and was the largest structure within the complex. Actually, several closely packed buildings, the structure was about 400 meters long and about 160 meters wide at its widest part. The east end of the building was about 300 meters from the Volga River. The key locations and features outside the Martinovsky shop included 
elevated frame catwalks, a large number of tall smokestacks, the Hall 4 Administration Building, a large stone and rubble pile at the northeast corner, stacks of bricks between the northwest entrance and Hall 12, the locomotive repair shop, Hall 3, a large drainage culvert leading from the building to the Finger Ravine, and a huge slag heap between the hall and the worker settlement. Although tactics have changed since the fighting at the Red October factory, the area provides an opportunity to analyze urban terrain from the standpoint of current doctrine. Outside Hall 4, the ground was littered with the rubble and debris of buildings, shredded trees and bushes, collapsed smokestacks, destroyed trucks, rail cars, and factory equipment, and the metal products from the factory. The ground was pulverized with shell and bomb craters. To the northwest, the building was very narrow, only about 40 meters across, and had one large entrance in a collapsed corner on the very end of the building from which the defenders could shoot out towards the Hall 12 warehouse complex. The openings were also initially used by the Germans as the primary entrances into the structure. To the north and west of the hall were stacks of brick and a large stone pile, both of which the Germans would use as assault positions for attacking into the building. The massive structure itself was constructed of a mixture of cream-colored brick, steel girders, and sheet metal walls. There were relatively clear fields of fire toward the northeast, but initially few, if any, good positions for defenders on that side due to the hall's closed heat doors, which had been blocked off, thus providing no openings to fire through. The Soviets could and did, however, have a few defensive positions outside the hall in the factory administration building and in the rubble and twisted metal frames of the partially collapsed elevated catwalks. Soviet snipers would also use the multiple smokestacks alongside the structure for elevated shooting positions. There was another large entrance on the southeast side through which an attacking force could gain entry as well. As the building continued to sustain damage from indirect fire and aerial attacks, other openings in the walls appeared over time that provided additional access and also opened up better fields of fire for the defenders within. In the rear of the building was a huge slag heap composed of the useless afterwaste of the Martin furnaces. The mound was used as a fallback position and reserve assembly area by the Soviets, as was the burned out settlement nearby. All of these conditions made movement very difficult for attackers and defenders both, but also provided cover and concealment for both as well. Key locations inside the Martinovsky shop included a series of Martin furnaces along the northeast wall, a large water trough in the long northwestern end of the building, concrete catwalks, a rolling mill, and an entrance into the large drainage culvert at the south end of the building. Subsurface areas complicate fires, friendly control measures, and force protection. They can be utilized as avenues of approach as well as lines of communication. They can be used as protected storage areas, and they can be exploited by small units for attacks against the enemy's rear and flanks. The Soviets approached the Martinovsky shop from the Volga River via the Finger Ravine, then through a smaller, narrow gully and into a large underground drainage culvert which emerged inside the building. The ravine and culvert provided a covered and concealed route for reinforcements moving into the hall. The interior areas of Hall 4 were an attacker's nightmare. Large amounts of brick, concrete, steel, and other rubble from the repeated aerial bombings and artillery shells littered the entire floor. Wrecked steel manufacturing machinery, parts of partially completed projects, and large steel ingots also served as obstacles to an attacker and as cover and concealment for the defenders. Much of the large twisted steel framing, girders, and roofing from the building's rooftop lay collapsed into the building's interior adding to an attacker's difficulty. The roof itself was almost completely blown off or burned by the repeated attacks of the Luftwaffe and German artillery barrages. Concrete catwalks and the metal framing in the roof, at least where it was still in place, also served as platforms for the ever-present Soviet snipers. The defenders could also climb inside the now cold Martin furnaces as hiding places and for protection. The ovens not only provided shelter from the attacking German troops, their heavy steel construction provided protection from artillery and aerial bombs. A direct hit was required to destroy these heavy steel ovens. It is likely, however, that the concussion from near misses from large bombs or artillery rounds wounded, 
or otherwise disabled many of the defenders regardless. In addition to the furnaces, there was a large water drainage trough which ran the width of the building and provided the Soviets a ready-made defensive position inside. At 1855 on the evening of 23 October, Seidlitz ordered Schwerin to continue the attack the next day. The division plan was for Eichler's 212th Infantry to hold what ground it had gained the day before and clear out the rest of Hall 8 and Hall 8A and the workers' villages to the south. Otherwise, the Kampf Group would assume a defensive posture to help defeat any Soviet counterattacks launched against the main objective, the Martinovsky shop, while it was under assault by Wolf's 208th Infantry. Weber's 54th Jaeger Regiment was relieved from the 79th Division that evening and attached to the 14th Panzer Division next door. Operating with that command, the 54th Jaegers would attack generally southeastward to help the Panzer Division clear the workers' villages between the Red October and the Barricade factories and prevent Soviet reinforcement from that direction. For the 24 October attack, Wolf's 208th Infantry, once again the main effort, was reinforced by a company of the 179th Pioneer Battalion, which would hold Hall 3 when the regiment attacked to seize Hall 4. Wolf's plan for the 208th Infantry was for the 2nd Battalion to attack from Halls 3, 6, and 7 to seize Hall 4. From there, it would also provide fire support for the 1st Battalion's attack on Halls 1 and 2. Once Halls 1, 2, and 4 were under German control, the division would push on to the clear of the rest of the factory complex down to the Volga. Operations for 24 October began at 0300 when the 212th Infantry began efforts to clear out the resistance remaining in Halls 8 and 8A. By mid-morning, the buildings had been captured, but both were soon lost to counterattacks by the 112th Guards Rifle Regiment. At about the same time, the 208th's assaults began on the Martinovsky shop. Advancing from Halls 3, 6, and 7, the 2nd Battalion, which was the 208th Infantry's main effort, attempted to quickly advance into the huge Martinovsky shop, but it was initially held up by heavy small arms fire from the 120th Guards Rifle Regiment. Meanwhile, the 1st Battalion began its advance on Halls 1 and 2. Against surprisingly weak resistance, the troops of the 1st Battalion advanced from its line west of Hall 4 and proceeded to clear a series of smaller buildings in the northwest corner of the factory. Then, advancing from one pile of rubble to another and through myriad shell craters, the battalion successfully reached Halls 1 and 2 after a moderately stiff fight, but were able to capture only the southern half of both structures. Other elements of the 1st Battalion continued the advance east and briefly penetrated once again to the Volga River, but a counterattack by the 39th Division's Reserve, the 117th Guards Rifle Regiment, successfully erased that penetration by dusk. U.S. Army doctrine emphasizes that defensive plans retain a reserve regardless of the defensive task assigned. The counterattack is one of the key actions of urban defense. As the attacker moves into the depth of the urban area, the attacker's forces may become fatigued, suffer from attrition, and become increasingly disorganized. As the offensive force reaches the culmination point where it can no longer continue to attack with the available forces, the defensive commander executes a planned and coordinated counterattack. The counterattack regains the initiative and makes the enemy fight in multiple directions. Infiltration using superior knowledge of the terrain and the skillful use of stay-behind forces permits attacking the enemy throughout the depth of its formations. In planning the defense, commanders anticipate that the enemy will attempt to isolate the urban area. Commanders defeat this effort by allocating sufficient defending forces outside the urban area to prevent its isolation. The Soviets maintain lines of communications across the Volga to prevent isolation of the forces defending the Red October factory complex. They were also able to provide forces to repeatedly conduct effective counterattacks to reverse German tactical gains in the vicinity of the Martinovsky shop and prevent German isolation of the Red October factory. The main attack on the Martinovsky shop initially ran into stiff resistance. Unable to enter Hall 4, the 2nd Battalion's assault troops advanced to positions near and against the northwest wall of the structure. Eventually entering through the northwestern end of the building, the Germans fought their way slowly into the hall. The battle inside was fierce and slow. Fighting at very close range with submachine guns, grenades, and satchel charges, 
the German infantry and engineers gradually forced their way farther into the building, moving from one pile of rubble to another for protection, while the Soviet defenders tenaciously fought back with submachine guns, hand grenades, and Molotov cocktails. The lead combat group eventually fought its way to about 50 meters short of the drainage trough by sundown and made preparations to defend there for the night. To the division's north, the 54th Jaeger Regiment advanced only about 100 meters on its front, but still failed to take the railroad bridge. Once again that evening, the 79th Division's left flank, facing the Soviet 193rd Rifle Division, was thinly held and in some places non-existence. The Soviet defenders, however, were either too weak to exploit the gaps or failed to detect them. Seidlitz's plan for the 79th Division's 25 October attack was essentially the same as the day before, and Schwerin's focus was now on completing the seizure of the Martinovsky shop. That mission remained assigned to Wolf's 208th Infantry, but like the rest of the division, the casualties of the last two days of combat had severely depleted the regiment. In order to help Wolf accomplish the task, Schwerin provided him a small comp group assembled from the elements of the 212th Infantry and attached it to the 208 to give it enough combat power for the assault. When the 54th Jaeger Regiment was transferred to the 14th Panzer Division on 24 October, the 369th Croatian Infantry Regiment replaced the Jaegers in the 79th Division's order of battle. Schwerin assigned the Croatians the mission of defending Halls 9 and 10. This action allowed Eichler's 212th to compress its defenses in order to squeeze out enough troops to help man the ad hoc combat group. Wolf's plan was simple continue to push men and weapons into Hall 4 to kill or capture the remaining defenders inside, or force them to retreat from the structure. Moving more men into the hall that morning, Wolf's 2nd Battalion attacked and gradually forced its way almost to the middle of the building. Once there, however, a large number of Soviet soldiers came pouring out of the drainage culvert and the Martin furnaces where they had been hiding. Apparently, the 120th Guards Rifle Regiment had been reinforced with men from the Division Reserve during the night. The counterattack surprised the German assault troops who desperately fought back against the now swelling tide of Russian soldiers. Grudgingly, the German troops fought their way back to the portals at the northwest end of the building, through which they had come the day before and were eventually forced back into Hall 3 and to positions behind the stacks of bricks to the west. By dark, the Russians held the entire Martinovsky shop once again. Fighting continued on 26 October, but no significant attacks were undertaken by either side. That evening, Schwerin's 3rd Regiment, the 226th Infantry, arrived back under the division's control and relieved the 54th Jaeger Regiment of its positions near the bridge. The 79th Infantry Division once again assumed responsibility for that sector. Schwerin immediately issued the new regiment orders for an attack on the morning of the 27th of October. The 226th initial mission was to enhance the isolation of the Martinovsky shop by completing the capture of Halls 1 and 2, as well as eliminate the bulge between the 79th Division and the 14th Panzer Division. As planned, the 226th Infantry attacked at dawn on 27 October and immediately ran into stiff opposition at both locations. Despite support from the 1st Battalion 208th, it took the regiment all day to complete the capture of the two halls. However, it also successfully erased the bothersome salient in the German lines as well. In the process, the 226th Infantry suffered 23 killed in action and 69 wounded in action, but it was now in position to make the next attack against the Martinovsky shop. On 28 October, the 226th Infantry relieved the 208th Infantry of responsibility for Hall 1 in preparation for the attack, while Stuka dive bombers rockets, and artillery hammered the Martinovsky shop all day. That night, a battalion of the 226th Infantry, advancing from Hall 2, attacked into the main hall. This time, some of the troops were armed with flamethrowers. The flame assault took the Soviet defenders completely by surprise, and the German troops were able to penetrate deep into Hall 4. However, the Soviet guardsmen were able to use the rubble and knowledge of the interior to circle to the left and right flanks of the assault force and eventually drove the troops of the 226th out of the structure. This attack cost the Germans an additional 12 killed and 52 wounded, and no advantage was gained. On the 29th, Schwerin ordered the entire 226th Infantry to attack Hall 4 once again. 
This time, the battalions approached the structure from Halls 1 and 2. The regiment was able to gain another foothold in the building, but this achievement, like the others, was short-lived. The troops were soon driven out once again, this time with 19 killed and 96 wounded. This attack concluded efforts against the Martinovsky shop for the next five days. The 226th Infantry was now already too weak to continue the attacks against the hull. The 39th Guards Rifle Division was not in good shape either. According to Troikov, all three regiments of the division had been reduced to about 80 men each by the 30th of October. Therefore, Choikov requested permission from Yeremenko to bring over the 45th Rifle Division from its island defense mission in the Volga. It would take time to assemble this fresh division from its dispersed locations, so the elements were sent over piecemeal. Still, these reinforcements for the 39th Guards Division arrived just in time. From the 30th of October to 3 November, as the 45th Rifle Division made its way to the west bank of the Volga, the 79th Infantry Division consolidated its positions and prepared for the next assault to take the Martinovsky shop. That attack was scheduled to take place on 4 November by Wolf's reinforced 208th Infantry. In the meantime, on 1 November, the remnants of the 24th Panzer Division went into the line on the 79th Division's immediate right and took over the southern defenses of the Red October factory to shorten the 79th sector. Two days later, on 3 November, the 369th Croatian Regiment was moved to take over the defense of Halls 1 and 2, while the 208th Infantry was reinforced with troops from Schrerin's other two regiments for the upcoming assault on Hall 4. This time, Wolf planned to have his men attack from Hall 3 into the Martinovsky shop from the south, fight their way through the hall, and make contact with German elements on the north side. The attack was scheduled to begin at dusk. After additional heavy artillery and aerial bombing attacks, Wolf's men jumped off on the assault but quickly ran into fire. Nevertheless, the troops fought their way into the building and conducted a very close quarters battle with the 120th Guards Rifle Regiment, now reinforced with men from the 45th Division's 253rd Regiment. Fighting in and near the Martinovsky shop all night, the Germans were able to make their way once again deep into the hall, but in the end, the reinforcements from the 45th Rifle Division coming into the building from the tunnel tipped the scales. By dawn 5 November, Wolf had ordered his men out of the hall. Even if his men had taken the structure, they likely could not have held it with the remaining force. The 79th Infantry Division was now exhausted. It did not have the men to mount another attack. The 39th Guards Division, in contrast, was in better shape now that the troops of the 45th Division were on hand. The high expenditure of resources by both sides and the culmination of the German 6th Army before Stalingrad was captured highlights the importance of planning. Due to the complexity of urban environments, commanders must carefully arrange their forces and operations according to purpose, time, and space to accomplish the mission. The application of the tenets of unified land operations should inform both plans and the conduct of all operations to include those conducted in and around urban areas. Successfully synchronizing and converging effects across the breadth and depth of their assigned areas of operation during large-scale combat operations requires that each echelon has a shared understanding of their roles and responsibilities. What would be the final effort to seize the Martinovsky shop would now take place on 11 November with the beginning of Operation Hubertus. Hubertus was what would amount to Paulus's final effort to seize the remaining areas of the Red October and Barricade factories still under Soviet control. The operation would, in theory, finally enable the 6th Army to wrest control of Stalingrad from Troikov's 62nd Army. The main element of this effort was six understrength pioneer battalions detached from divisions well outside of Stalingrad, which had been ordered to the city to reinforce the 6th Army. Part of the 79th Infantry Division's role in Hubertus would consist of a joint attack between the 24th Panzer Division's Kampfgruppe Schiel and the 2nd Battalion 208th Infantry against Hall 10, half of which had been recaptured by the 112th Guards Rifle Regiment the day before. The main effort, however, was the Division's own 179th Pioneer Battalion, which was designated to spearhead the attack on Hall 4. To increase its manpower, the battalion was reinforced with the 3rd Company, 40th Pioneer Battalion, from the 24th Panzer Division. The battalion would then be backed up by almost 1,000 or so remaining troops of Wolf's 208th Infantry 
and other troops that would form the covering group, and 191 men from the 369th Croatian Regiment in support. The 179th Pioneers commander, Captain Helmut Veltz, organized the assault group into four combat wedges of about 30 men each, or about 120 total, divided into two waves. Wedges 2 and 3 would penetrate into the northwest end of the Martinovsky shop and advance inside the building, clearing the long, narrow hall there. In addition to clearing the hall, those two wedges were to hold the Soviets' attention, while wedges 1 and 4 advanced along the outside of the hall in an effort to enter the building farther down and get in behind the defenders. The wedges would be followed by the 208 Infantry's covering group, which would add weight to the attack and hold all ground gained by the pioneers. The pioneers were armed with submachine guns, grenades, satchel charges, and flamethrowers to fight their way into the hall. The attack was to commence at 0355 with a massive artillery barrage. The fight for the Red October factory offers excellent examples of combined arms warfare in urban terrain. In this battle's early phase, the Germans used close air support and artillery to suppress and neutralize Soviet positions in the factory area. They also used armor to make breaches in the railcar obstacle forward of the Red October factory. In the following battles for the factory's buildings, the German army assaulted Red Army positions with teams composed of infantry and engineers formed into waves. U.S. Army doctrine emphasizes the use of small tactical combined arms teams in urban offensive operations. These teams rely on a flexible mix of infantry, armor, aviation, engineers, and artillery capable of both precision fires and suppression. In the final assault on the Martinovsky shop, synchronized fires suppress Soviet positions after which waves of infantry and pioneers armed with satchel charges and flamethrowers advanced into the building. German intelligence indicated the Martinovsky shop was now manned by 130 men of the 120th Guards Rifle Regiment, 205 men from the 2nd Battalion, 253rd Rifle Regiment, and 60 men from the 39th Guards Anti-Tank Company for a total of about 400 defenders. Captain Veltz began moving his troops into position before midnight, and by about 0250, all four wedges were in their assault positions. Wedge 1 was located in Hall 3. Wedge 2 was at the south end of the brick stacks. Wedge 3 was positioned at the north end of the stacks. Wedge 4 was located at a stone pile near the brick stacks. At 0340, the assault positions unexpectedly came under heavy Soviet artillery bombardment. Five men in the first wave of Wedge 3 were killed or wounded by the fire, as was another five in the second wave of Wedge 2. Fifteen minutes later, the German barrage began. The artillery bombardment was very short, but the fire from a battery of large 210 millimeter mortars designed to prevent the Soviet reinforcement into the penetration area, lasted much longer. The mortar fire was linear and placed about the center of the main hall area. Meanwhile, German anti-aircraft guns raked the remaining steel girders of the roof and the smokestacks to kill or distract the plethora of Russian snipers in the complex. Jumping off from the stack of bricks to the west of the Hall 4 entrances, Wedge 2 was able to reach the northwestern entrance and fight its way inside under heavy fire. It managed to advance into the structure for only about 30 yards before it was stopped by the tangle of wreckage in the building in heavy Soviet small arms fire. To the left, the already weakened Wedge 3 also successfully bounded it to the walls near the entrance at the narrow western end of the building, but there the sergeant leading the group was struck by small arms fire. Nevertheless, that wedge pushed into the hall and made it about as far as Wedge 2 before it too was halted by obstacles and fire. Advancing from Hall 3, Wedge 1 moved past the locomotive shed and was about to turn east toward its intended entrance before it was suddenly fired on by a dug-in, well-hidden machine gun nest near where the wedge commander planned to enter the building. Another gun opened up shortly thereafter, and the wedge commander ordered his troops into a large shell hole. There, the wedge set up a defense position to provide covering and suppressive fire for the other wedges. Wedge 4 jumped off from the pile of stones and was able to move along the northwest face of the outside wall, for about 100 meters before it was met with a hail of machine gun and small arms fire from holes in the building. The wedge was forced back to the stone pile. Now stranded inside the building with no outside support coming into the enemy rear as planned, the commanders of wedges 2 and 3 decided to pull their troops out of the Martinovsky shop to prevent their annihilation. Within a few minutes, wedge 3 had made it back to the stack of bricks, while wedge 2 opted to head for hall 3, closely followed by wedge 1 as they passed by. 
Once again, the assault was a failure and cost the 179th Pioneers 54 men of the 120 who began the mission. The 79th Division was no longer able to seriously consider capturing the Martinovsky shop, and no further attacks against the building took place during the remainder of the battle for Stalingrad. Operation Hubertus concluded on 18 November 1942, but it was obvious before then that the effort had failed. The 62nd Army still held parts of the Red October and Barricade factory complexes. Throughout the battle, Troikov's tough Soviet soldiers had held out against everything that the 6th Army could send against them, but just barely. Still, Troikov's efforts in the city provided enough time for the Stavka to resource and organize a major counterattack against Army Group B. This operation, codenamed Uranus, was launched in the early morning hours of 19 November 1942. Within three days, the 6th Army was surrounded. Although there was a brief effort by Army Group Don in December to rescue Paulus and his command, that operation failed. On 2 February 1943, Paulus was forced to surrender about 250,000 troops. Additionally, numerous tanks, artillery pieces, and other equipment were removed from the German order of battle. Stalingrad had begun as a secondary objective for the German Army as part of Case Blue. The 6th Army was to seize the city in order to secure the northern flank of the German forces while Army Group A conducted the main effort to capture the oil fields and refineries in the Caucasus. In fact, taking the oil-rich Caucasus proved to be too difficult of a task and Stalingrad began to evolve as a more important objective for the Germans. Eventually, Hitler and other German leaders became obsessed with capturing the massive urban complex. The 6th Army strained every effort to seize the city pouring troops into the fight and leaving its flanks vulnerable to the Soviet counterstroke. By hanging on to the last pieces of Soviet-controlled terrain in Stalingrad, Troikov's forces drew the Wehrmacht and its allies into a trap and one of the most decisive Axis defeats of the war. When viewed through the lens of the current operating environment, the Battle of Stalingrad provides current military professionals a superb case study for analyzing military operations in urban terrain. Although technology and tactics have changed the contemporary battlefield, one can still learn a great deal by examining the operations of the two opponents who contended in the city. Using current U.S. Army doctrine to compare and contrast those operations, one can develop extremely useful insights and a greater understanding of the brutal and resource-intensive nature of city fighting.